Hi there. It's the penultimate lecture. Today we're discussing image analysis and flow cytometry. You know, when I set these out on the agenda, I didn't immediately perceive just how closely related these two fields really are. But when we look at the data analysis, we see an awful lot of overlapping themes in considering the data from, uh, from uh, biological images and the data from flow cytometry. So I'm really glad that these subjects are brought together in, under one roof. So uh, I wanted to note that uh, my old class had a lecture on biological image analysis, uh, but it was taught by a fellow named Mike McCaughey, so I borrowed a lot of his themes in uh, presenting this topic here. I've also borrowed very heavily from the people at Purdue University's cytometry laboratories. Uh, so when you look at the PDF, you should see that these links are actually live. You can go see a huge volume of information that they've made available to educators in this space. So uh, we're going to start with measurements of light intensity because the way that we represent those and the way that we manipulate those in, in still images plays into how we analyze them in motion, uh, in, in motion video or in the, the world of flow cytometry. So we'll look at uh, problems with processing imaging data. We're going to have a little bit of time talking about math, not a huge amount, but some uh, for us to consider. Um, and from there, we'll move into the fine world of flow cytometry. Uh, so flow cytometry can mean a lot of things. You might hear the term flow sorting, for example, um, but they all work off of essentially the same principles, so I want you to, uh, to get uh, some experience with that. We'll even talk a little bit about uh, some new evolutions in, this, in the space of flow cytometry uh, called CyTOF that has made the complexity of the data quite a lot more significant. All right. Probably at some point you've looked through a microscope. When we deal with ordinary bright field uh, uh, microscopy, we have some image that's, that's got light being shown on this object. Light bounces off of that sample through an objective lens, through another set of optics, and eventually that light gets to your eye through the eyepiece. So I want you to think about the, uh, the illumination here and the receipt of that signal. Right? So you have um, ambient light in the room or you have a light on the stage of the, uh, of the microscope or maybe you have light shining up from below, something like that, some sort of you know, broad spectrum light reaching the sample. That light is, re is reflecting off uh, to, uh, in certain colors that is being passed through these, uh, uh, these uh, optics and it finally hits your eye, which in turn has its own optics, of course. Uh, that is a little different than what we're talking about when we work with the fine word of world of confocal microscopy. So here, instead of having uh, just any old light, whether it's a, a room lamp or the sun or light shining up or light shining down, we have lasers producing our illumination. And these lasers are very closely matched in frequency with fluorophores that are, that are uh, in the sample itself. So this uh, these lasers are focused on a particular point within the sample, and that light causes a fluorophore, the, the dye attached to the sample, to fluoresce. So the laser gives a photon, and the sample gives back, it emits a photon of a different wavelength. So we give, uh, we, we excite with one wavelength, and then we get back another one. So that emission is then uh, collected through a PMT, a, pho a photon multiplier. We've talked a little bit about electron multipliers recently when we were talking about mass spectrometry. Remember we had ions leaving the trap and those ions hit an electron multiplier and the arrival of those ions led to a cascade of other, uh, of other electron pairs being kicked loose and creating a, an exponential signal that we could measure. In the same way, a photon multiplier is able to to, uh, to record the um, to, is able to record the, the photons that have been emitted from the sample. So how does that work? Now I, I could have shown you one of these when we were talking about an electron multiplier, but here we have a, a photo multiplier. So first off, it's blind color. These things are monochromatic. Any photon that arrives uh, at the sample is going to be received and amplified into an electrical signal. Receipt of a photon, cascade of electrons. Everyone has that? So it's very like an electron multiplier, but instead of an ion arriving, we have a photon arriving to kick off that cascade. 
So you can see that we've got our photocathode that, that produces the initial uh, stream of ions. The dynodes in turn amplify that signal. So how do we say that a photon multiplier is detecting a particular color? As I said, they're monochromatic. They'll take any light and they don't really care. So in front of these, we have a filter that is only allowing a particular wavelength to pass through. I suppose you've, uh, you've all worn, for example, red sunglasses at some point in your life, and you, you notice that the, what things appear bright and which things appear darker is different than when you're seeing all the different frequencies. In the same way, to these detectors, they, they're only able to see at this one particular wavelength, but if, there's, if that wavelength is not present, it's just all dark. So these filters are what determine what, uh, what produces bright signal, in other words. Now, we use photon multipliers all the time. Every time you're taking a selfie, your phone is uh, converting a series of photons into electrical signals at different locations in different colors. So we, we can think of that as capturing you know, red and green and blue uh, contributions in the light that your camera receives to produce a composite signal that, that scores each pixel on each of those three values. And here, we're going to be using these, these, um, these charge coupled devices to measure just a certain set of frequencies of, of light that it, that's coming through. These are the emissions from the sample. We talked a fair bit about 24-bit representations of images earlier this morning. Uh, and I want to reemphasize that point that out of some image in digital space, we're going to carve that up into a bunch of dots. When you, when you read how many megapixels this camera phone will produce or how many, uh, how many dots are present in the cell, that, that's what you're getting, the, the number of dots that are available in this image. So something like one megapixel these days is a relatively, uh, a, a relatively shady detector. It's not, very, it's not going to carve up the picture into a whole bunch of tiny little elements. We're accustomed to seeing you know, phones with, with or, 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 photo, or proper cameras with 10 megapixel detectors, which means that you're getting thousands of columns and thousands of rows of these dots. So each of those pixels being one of these, uh, one of these, coordinate, uh, one of these uh, intersections of rows and columns is going to have some amount of intensity reported for it. So you can think of a standard JPEG image, for example, but really more like a TIFF, something that hasn't been compressed as much, as, as consisting of three different images, one in red, one in green, and one in blue. And for each position within that, within that array, we have some brightness of red, or some brightness of green, or some brightness of blue. So the image that we see it combines the signals of all three of those separate images. So three, mono, uh, three monochrome images are combined essentially for us to see color. So we see eight bits in each byte, and that, that byte here is representing the brightness for this color at this position of the, of, the, of the image. So if it's set to zero, that means dark. If it's set to 255, that means very, very bright, as bright as you can go on that particular channel. So, uh, so when we have 24 bits, we are combining together a red and a green and a blue signal. Intensities in each of those make the color that we see for one pixel. How do things change as we alter the bit depth at which we allow these intensity differences to be seen? If I say that there's only one bit for a pixel, uh, what, what am I generally talking about? What, what would the image be that resulted from using only one bit to store the, uh, the, the intensity at a particular pixel? What kind of image would you describe that as? What that would be saying is that you either have a, you, you have a, a bright spot or you have a dark spot. So if you have just one bit of pixel, you have effectively a black and white picture. So if you take a one bit picture of me rather than a 24 bit picture of me, uh, you, you might get something dark reflecting my glass, uh, from my glasses and you might have some, some bright spots uh, in here. Maybe my skin would paste out altogether and I would be entirely uh, white on the picture. My tie might be a, a darker patch down the, down the front of me. But 
as, as you can tell, you, you would lose an awful lot of contrast uh, in the image. You're just going to have white and black. That's not, a, that's not a wide palette to draw from in intensities. So when you have one bit image right here, you have just black spots and white spots comprising your image. When you go to two bits, you can have four different shades of gray. All right? You could have a black, a dark gray, a light gray, and a white. That's basically it. So two bits will give you four different intensities that could, that could be represented. So in binary, we would say that you've got, you've got values of 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. Does everyone see that? That's how you get four different shades of gray from two binary uh, digits. If you go to three digits, if you go to three bits, in other words, you can have eight different shades of gray. And you can see that we've already gotten quite a lot more lifelike in stepping up to three bits. That's eight shades. Four bits, we get to 16. Five bits, we get to 32. Six bits, we get to 64 different shades of gray. So our ability to capture intensity in bit depth greatly increases the number of gradations in, in light uh, that we measure at each position. All good so far? OK. So all that nonsense I was uttering about binary digits uh, last Tuesday, that's where this comes into play. You need to be able to know that increasing the bits by 1 doubles the number of intensity levels that you can capture. OK. Now, let's have a little moment to talk about the electromagnetic spectrum. Do we see the majority of the electromagnetic spectrum? We do not. We do not. In fact, what we see fits in here very, very neatly. So I wanted to remind you about the relationship, the inverse relationship, between frequency and wavelength. The left side of this, up here in gamma rays, we talk about those as the most energetic photons that we really ever work with. So gamma rays have extremely high frequencies, but they have extremely, oh, sorry, I'm saying this backwards. <laughs> no. They have extremely high frequencies, but they have extremely short wavelengths. They're very, very energetic. When I ask the question about the, um, the resolution that's possible with X-ray, um, uh, X-ray crystallography, in part I'm asking about how long is the wavelength that these X-rays have? Because if you have a very short wavelength, your ability to resolve different features that are close together is much better than if you're dealing with a longer wavelength. So the higher frequencies give us clearer pictures, better resolved pictures of fine details. UV is better than visible light for that. Visible light packaged into this little range. You know, we've got our, our, our uh, most powerful photons are at the blue end of the spectrum. The weakest ones are up here at the IR spectrum. So what happens if you subject a human to a lot of ultraviolet radiation? You burn, right. That's because UV photons carry a big wallop when they come. On the other hand, what kind of light do we put a, a hamburger under when we're not sure when a customer is going to order it? You know we do this, right? We do this. Well, imagine that we are at a fast food chain, possibly American in origin. They're not sure when someone's going to order this hamburger. They are now leaving this hamburger under a light. They don't want to cook the burger, but they want to keep it warm. So what do they use? Infrared, yeah. So one of these beams over here will cook you if you sit on the beach for too long. One of these photons over here, however, it's nice and light. It's just going to keep your burger warm until you decide that you're ready to eat it. So there's a lot of power difference then in these, in these, uh, in these photons. And we're going to talk about differences in wavelength as we move further. Meanwhile, you can get all the way out here to FM radio waves. Has anyone been hit by an FM radio wave today? Of course. Yeah, FM is moving through the air all the time. So we've got these, these 
low frequency, long wavelengths just zipping through the atmosphere, and they don't cook us at all. So where you sit in this spectrum is going to have a lot to do with how energetic uh, that each, each photon is. All right. Which brings us to the fine topic of fluorescence. Chromophores uh, is, is one of the terms that we use to relate, uh, to, to describe molecules that can absorb light and that can kick out, that can emit light in response. So when we deal with proteins, I've mentioned UV detectors before. A UV detector measures how much protein is in a sample based on its emission through fluorescence. So tryptophan has a side chain that allows it to accept light and respond by emitting light at a different wavelength. That's what a UV, the principle on which a UV detector works. So when you see rings like this in a structure, these are examples of aromatic rings. We call them aromatic because those molecules also tend to smell, but in this case, aromatic rings are a pretty good indicator that you've got to start on some molecule, molecule that you can use to, um, uh, to fluoresce in a molecule. Okay, so how can we cause fluorescence? We need to have a dye of some sort, a chromophore of some sort, that receives a particular frequency and that, rele that emits a photon at a different frequency that we can associate with our biological entities. So maybe that's going to be something like green fluorescent protein, for example. This is one of the uh, these short, bits, uh, short stretch of, uh, stretches of amino acids that we can stick onto certain biological structures to cause them to fluoresce. But we still need some way to excite that, fluor that, that chromophore, or that fluorophore, either way. So we've got lamps, lasers, and laser diodes. So um, I realize that this is an American figure, and you can probably tell why. That's the Lincoln Monument, uh, the Lincoln Memorial, rather, on the, on the back of a one cent United States penny. So a, a United States penny is about how big, and we see that this laser diode is minuscule by comparison. So it might be that the most recent movie you watched about lasers was Real Genius, and you think, oh my gosh, this whole table could hold one laser. But in fact, we make lasers on all kinds of different scales. I mean, think of a laser pointer, right? The laser inside that is minuscule. So these uh, so we, can, we have a wide variety of ways to produce lasers, and we can make them very inexpensively to produce particular uh, wavelengths that we want to measure. Now this, gets, this is, is uh, the part that explains why I was spending all that time talking about the electromagnetic spectrum. The Stokes shift tells us about the change in the incoming photon and the outgoing photon from this process of fluorescence. So in this case, we have received a wavelength of 495 nanometers, and we gave back a longer wavelength instead. We gave back a 520. So of those two, which photon carries more power? Yes, the, the incoming one obviously does, yes. You, due to conservation of energy, you can't have a more powerful emission than you have excitation. So for every one photon that comes in at the shorter wavelength, higher frequency, more powerful, we have a drop, or sorry, an increase rather, in the wavelength and a drop in the frequency, a drop in the power that is called the, the Stokes shift. This is how much energy is lost through this process of fluorescing. So I, I would point out that in, if you're measuring on multiple chromophores, you need to have multiple emission, uh, sorry, multiple excitation frequencies and multiple fluorescent intensities, multiple emission fluorescence uh, frequencies. So this is going to be one of those things that shows up later on when we talk about compensation. In fact, here's a figure on that subject. So let us imagine that we have two different molecules in our sample. One is colored, flu is, is fluorescein, and one is PE. These have different emission, uh, 
different emission profiles and what wavelengths they produce. So we see that fluorescent uh, maxes out at about 488 nanometers, and this uh, and uh, PE maximizes at about 575. So if you're going to pass this light to a filter, sorry, pass this light through a filter in order to capture uh, its intensity at a charge coupled device that's got all these photo photomultipliers, we need to make sure that the photomultiplier can tell ex that we have a very clear notion of which frequencies are going to trigger a signal in our photon multiplier. So if we use a bandpass filter that is capturing this region, the, the, re the region that we capture in would have some amount of contribution from the PE fluorescence and more contribution from the fluorescein. So we need to be sure that these that the uh, these filters are set to appropriate ranges to match the fluorescence that they're going to receive the uh, for the the emission profile that they're going to get. And the more dyes that we try to pack into this space, the more complex it's going to be in the overlaps that we see among different emission uh, frequencies. Okay. I'm just going to point out that this little, this little dark blue space right here reflects the extent to which the leading edge of the PE emission contributes a bit of signal to the fluorescent uh, signal. So this is an amount that even if there's no fluorescent uh, emitting at all, to the photomultiplier it looks like there's a little signal because the shoulder of this PE fluorescence contributes to its signal as well. That's crosstalk, in other words, from one signal to the next. So I want to highlight that we need to be able to get information from these images, and that information comes from a contrast in intensity information. So if we are, if we have good signal to noise, that means that the information coming back... Oh, those birds are really aggressive today, aren't they? So the signal to noise here means that we need, to be have, we need to have a good distinction between light and dark levels. If we have... Uh, if everything is using just the top 10% of what this detector can show us, we're not using the range very effectively. So having a dynamic range that, that shows us that... that where the, the difference in intensity that we see fills the whole span of our brightness detections is more informative than if we have just a very small amount of our total variation being used by the biological sample. So we want to optimize contrast when we're trying to make sense of the images that we're seeing. So I'm going to give this example uh, to start us off. At the left, we have a histogram. So we have the darkest values that are seen in the image, we have the lightest values that are seen in the image. This is just giving the whole range of all, uh, all detection values for this spectrum, or for this, for this image. And what we're showing is how frequently each of these intensity values is represented in the image. So if we've got a million, pictures, a, a million pixels here, we have a million contributions, a million counts to this histogram. So what you see in this case is that we have a pretty muddy picture. Most of, the, uh, most of the variation is falling in this very narrow range. It's not filling the entirety of our observed dynamic range. So let's make an adjustment to it. Everyone see that? Okay, we've just made things worse, in fact. Now uh, we're, we're getting, the, we, we've scaled how these values get considered and everything is bright. There's not a whole lot of dark for us to work with at this point. But if we get things right, we see that our images give us the whole gamut from dark, uh, from, from completely black to completely white. And this makes the features of that image stand out a whole lot more clearly. So this is a way in which we can optimize the capture of information and increase the contrast um, um, in software after we have them, if you have enough bit depth to do it. Ideally, you're dealing with a detector with even more than eight bits uh, capturing intensity at that point. 
There are, however, quite a few ways that we can manipulate these data after we've captured them. And kernel convolution is, is one of these methods that we see all over the place. If you've ever used uh, Photoshop or PaintShop or whatever uh, and evaluated a, uh, use a smoothing filter, it probably works something like this. Boy, excuse me. Okay, so let us start with, uh, with, this, with the source pixels. This is the image as it started in the first place. And in each cell, we, uh, let's, let's imagine that this is a black and white image, not, right, not red, green, or blue for the moment. So assume that this is just black and white. We have up to 256 different shades of gray that we can have, zero being complete black, 255 being completely white. So we've got these values that are written here and we want to apply a convolution filter to it. So this convolution filter, in this case, is a little three by three matrix. You can make them bigger as well. Um, this is set to be a Sobel filter. We'll talk about what that does in a, in a moment. But we've got little multipliers in here. Minus one, zero, one. Minus two, zero, two. And minus one, zero, one. What this filter is going to do is generate a new image that draws information together from an array of nine pixels for each pixel that we're going to write in our resulting image. So in our source image, we had 301, 262, 241. But now we're going to convolute these together. We're going to put together a, a bit of math. So this 3, we're going to multiply by that negative 1. This 0, we're going to multiply by this 0. This 1 by this 1, etc. You can see the math written up here. And then we sum together all of those products, and it gives us the value of negative three. So you see that this convolution filter was applied to the top three rows and top uh, and left three columns of the source image. We did a bit of math that combined the, the pixel intensities of the original image with our filter, and then we wrote in the middle of those nine cells the value that resulted from that filter. So we've, we started with an old image, and we started with a, a filter that defined how to combine values. Out of that popped one number that we were able to fill, that, that we were able to populate the middle of that, that filter in our destination image. So the image, uh, the, the destination pixel to the right of that would not multiply 3 by negative 1 again. Now this, this and this, the second, third, and fourth columns would be the source material for filling in this next cell over. So instead, we would have 0 times minus 1, 1 times 0, 5 times 1 for just the top row. We do the same math, and then we can populate the cell to the right in our destination image. OK, so the, the results of this filter, I think, are a little counterintuitive. But the math behind them should be, should be clear to everybody. So these kernels give us a way to combine information across pixels in a source image to create a final image. So the Gaussian uh, uh, kernel, I think, makes a little more sense. So why do we call this a Gaussian filter? We see it's got uh, ones at the corners, twos at the, at the uh, intersections, and then four uh, right in the center. So I want you to think about what this thing looks like uh, in three dimensions. I have a little three by three grid. My highest value is in the middle. My, I, I have values at half heights sitting around that. And then at the corners, I have a value of one. Does, does that, can, can you imagine what that looks like? It looks like a big hump sitting in space. This is a model of the Gaussian distribution as visualized in a three by three matrix. It's pretty low resolution. So when we use a Gaussian kernel filter, we are combining information, in this case, against, against these same 3 by 3 squares. You could make a Gaussian filter that was 5 by 5. That would be pretty easy to do as well. It's still going to be tallest in the middle and lowest on the edges. So when you apply a Gaussian like this, it produces a smooth on the image. We're going to see some examples of what that looks like. But the, the, the short version is that a Gaussian filter lets us kind of work the noise out of the picture. The, the assumption is that the, the pixels around the center give us another approximation of what the center should really look like. So if we have a noise pixel, 
it might get ironed out by the application of a Gaussian filter. Okay, so we, I showed you what the filter looked like. It's just this 1, 2, 1, 2, 4, 2, 1, 2, 1 filter. At the left, we have the source image. At the right, we have the destination image. It's not a huge effect, is it? But if you look at that image uh, on your laptops you and look at it really nice and close, you'll probably see that some subtle features got stripped out of here. For example, when I look at this little curve right here, right in the center of the image, there's kind of an arc. Right on the inside, there's a very light trace of an arc here as well. But once we apply the Gaussian filter, that inner edge sort of vanishes. This is because it's a very fine detail, and Gaussian filters tend to smooth those right out. So it's going to remove a lot of the high frequency variation that we have in the image, but still leave a lot of the, the signal behind. It's just not going to be, it's going to, uh, your image will not be robust against single pixel fe features being smoothed right out. Any questions so far on convolution filters? Okay, we're going to return to the Sobel filter. Now that, it didn't look like that was making any sense whatsoever, but in fact, the Sobel filter, this 1, 2, 1, 0, 0, 0, negative 1, negative 2, negative 1 filter, is an edge finder, and a rather excellent one at that. So here we see at the bottom of this image a substantial black feature that sits against a white background. And when we pass it through a Sobel filter, we get this really bright edge showing us where this feature sits. So Sobel has the ability to highlight these edges to a very great extent. Now, does it capture all of the edges? No. Up here at the top of the uh, top right quadrant of the image, we have a, uh, a mostly vertical feature that appears on the right edge of this of this uh, cell body, and we see that the Sobel filter nearly ignores it. So, in this case, we have a Sobel filter that's set um, horizontally, and as a result, it recognizes horizontal edges very well. But the but the uh, the other edge of the the, the vertical edges are not being matched quite as well. So when you run find edges on an on a image editing program, I want you to keep in mind that it's probably using a filter like this to do those detections. So what are the things that we try to do when we are working with um, microscopy images? We start with segmentation, which is a, a really critical one. We did an example of that this morning when we were in the, in the practical. We want to be able to separate objects from the background. In this visual field, we want to be able to say, how many are there of X, right? And if you are able to set your filters in the right, in the right way, you can lift out these objects to be, say, white against black or black against white either way, to, to cause a great increase in relief between the objects you're trying to count and the background that they sit in or other objects. You remember this morning we had a, a, a series of blue objects we were trying to highlight, even though there were also red and green objects in the same visual field. So we were able to specify um, you know, what color was the, the feature we were trying to pop out of the image. That is segmentation. Registration is really important, especially as we get to uh, dealing with things like motion video. I guess that's redundant, in video. So uh, has anyone here? And I'm going to be gentle about this. Has anyone here ever ripped a DVD? You know, you, some, somebody had a DVD and you wanted to have a copy to watch later. You didn't want to. A few people have done so. I, you are all copyright pirates. I have been myself a, a time or two in my life. Um, they're just going to. They're just going to put us all in jail. That's all there is to it. I'm sorry. You want to this online anymore? It's going to be online. You, it's, the video was. The camera was pointing at me, right? I've got to press record. Sorry. You're not recording? No, I'm kidding. Ah! <laughs> all right. <laughs> Could I just say all this again? Come on, man. All right. One of the things that might have surprised you is that the file you created from ripping a DVD was smaller than the volume of data on that DVD. I had to pull a trick like that. The answer is that DVDs are a relatively old encryption style called MPEG-2. And when you ripped it to your hard drive, you probably ripped it in something like MPEG-4 Part 10, 
you may not have told you that's what the format was, but it's pretty frequently used. Or H.264, sometimes you'll see a name like that. It's also the format in which we're storing this video on the, on the, the flash disks. So, MPEG-4 Part 10 handles registration brilliantly in a way that MPEG-2 cannot. MPEG-2 does not recognize the persistence of an object through time. And MPEG-4 Part 10 <laughs> recognizes that the bird at this, at this position in one cell is very slightly to the right in the next. So it's able to find, to compress the data more heavily by recognizing these objects moving around within the visual field. So this is an example of registration. Being able, your eye does this all the time. We see, um, when we're watching a movie, we don't ask, well, who is this person showing up in this cell of the movie when in the last cell, it, there was, the, the, the position was different. It's not the same person, right? Instead, our eyes detect these flashes of, of pictures and reconstruct the, the, the motion of a figure in it for us. That, in effect, is what registration is. But registration is not limited to time differences in, in images. They can also represent things like some successive slices off of something. If you used a cryotome to make very thin sections of a frozen sample, the slice that you see on the left and the, slice that, the next slice that you see may be very slightly different because you're looking at serial sections. So a process of registration can be used to map the position of the sample in one slice versus the position of the sample in the next slice. Okay, so this mapping of, of aligning two different images of the same scene is registration. Um, motion analysis is very valuable. It, it really extends upon registration. Here we're being able to recognize that uh, that through these time slices, we're able to detect that this object followed this course. And we'll see an example of that in a minute. And of course, quantifying really, really matters. Especially when you have multiple slices of the same thing, something confocal microscopy does very well, you will have uh, the ability to reconstruct the three-dimensional shape of a thing, and from that be able to compute volumes not just areas within a single slice, but volumes cast through multiple slices. So let us, let's look at this. So in the case of segmentation, we had the example this morning. I realize it's really, really dark, isn't it? Well, in your, in your slides on your laptops, you can probably see a lot more clearly. We have a bunch of objects in this field, probably cells, I believe. And you can see that each one is surrounded by a red outline. In this case, the software was asked find the edges of objects that look like this. And it responded by putting circles around all, all of the objects in the field. It even did some really nice things, like here we have a cell that overlaps and it butts a whole bunch of other cells. And the software is able to outline them separately to say, ah, this is an overlap. That's not an easy thing to do. OK, so, oh, so these are nuclei of uh, mouse 3T3, 3T3 cells. I've included citations here. I believe I grabbed the image from uh, this DOI, a, a particular article. Uh, and we have the, the image as well. Okay. So I mentioned Z stacks a moment ago. I wanted to define that a little better. When we think about a particular image in space, we have our, our X plane and we have our, 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 sorry, our X axis and our Y axis. This is a two dimensional image. But with confocal microscopy, you can capture image at multiple depths. So I may have a resolution in this picture of, of x versus y that's really great. But if I can also uh, accurately capture images at different depths into this, I may be able to stitch this together in such a way that I have not pixels, which are two-dimensional two dots, but voxels. Has anyone heard the term voxels before? V-O-X-E-L-S? So a pixel is a, a picture element at some x and some y value on, on, on a coordinate plane. A voxel is a point in a three-dimensional space. So I have my x and my y. By doing z stacks, I can produce images at different depths and from that reconstruct a three-dimensional shape. So in this case, we're able to use confocal microscopy and registration 
to recognize how those Z stacks fit together, to recognize features that are moving back and forth in, in three dimensions, not just two. Okay. I really appreciated the images from Purdue on this. Some of the images you can run across in this field are amazing. Okay, now I have a real phobia about including videos in my talks because they never work. Um, and then you forget, oh, I didn't do the sound and so on. But I have hopefully included a YouTube link right here where you can download, well, you can download, you can just watch this on your own. I, it's a very, very short video. It's like 10 seconds or something. It's not much, but it is uh, an example of somebody tracking cells over time and merging in the vasculature, right? So being able to track individual cells in their, mo in their motion within a body. So there's no real requirement that, uh, that organisms be dead when you're doing this imaging. You may be able to work with live systems and see how live systems are responding to a particular stimulus. So these tracks that we see are, are not part of the image. This is a reconstruction to show us where this particle started out and where it made it to. And so that little YouTube video is right there for you to, uh, to, move, uh, to, to show. An embryonic quail heart. Does anyone work with quail? People work with quail apparently. Maybe it's a very good uh, uh, cardiac model. I'm not actually sure. OK. And finally, being able to quantify really, really matters. Again, I borrowed this paper, uh, a figure from this paper, because I thought it was a good uh, measurement. So being able to do measurement in a live animal of a prostate cancer um, propagating through the animal. So being able to generate 3D volumes from these, not just 2D, but 3D images, um, gives us the ability to compute a volume of something, not just its area within a single plane. You can imagine that if you were to do just planar measurements on 3D objects, you'd frequently make a pretty big mistake in just how much uh, signal there was there. So being able to reconstruct the 3D shape of the thing gives us a much more accurate model of its, of its uh, magnitude. OK. This morning, I mentioned image J. I have uh, included the links for it here as well. But, um, you know, you, uh, you probably have it installed on your laptop now and can just run it yourself. It's very valuable whenever you want to automate the analysis of, it, of visual data to have a software like ImageJ. It's not another PaintShop Pro. It's not another Photoshop. It is intended for the quantitative analysis of biological data. It's very powerful. In this case, the, uh, the person was trying to measure how long is this worm? This is C. elegans, right? So we wanted to figure out how um, how to get from one end to the other, in, and by producing an outline of this, of this worm, it was able to produce a, a linear measurement of the thing, even though the worm was not obliging it by stretching out nice and, nice and straight. That's how life is, right? OK. So let's move on to talk about flow cytometry. Flow cytometry is like confocal microscopy in that it makes use of dyes to produce emissions that we measure for quantitation. So maybe we just want to say how many particles are there in this suspension. Maybe we want to be able to separate biologically active uh, constituents of a sample, not just how many particles of any sort there are. We can even find out which ones are, living, uh, are still alive. And it's extraordinarily fast because in a minute, you can, have, you can have evaluated a million different particles. That's a pretty incredible rate of speed. So being able to measure particle scatter as well as innate fluorescence or even secondary fluorescence, you have a lot of different means by which you can measure these signals. Innate fluorescence, uh, we already gave the example of tryptophan, right? So having hit tryptophan with UV, we get a, a fluorescence, a, an emission back that we can measure. That's an example of innate fluorescence. You don't have to engineer something to have tryptophan in it. And you can also sort. We mentioned cell sorting as one of these sort of synonyms of, of flow cytometry. This is a case where we don't just measure the, the particles. Rather, we separate them. So maybe you want to push all cells that are CD4 positive into a, a test tube, that you're, or into an Eppendorf, 
that you're going to analyze subsequently. So something like that is feasible with flow cytometry using cell sorting. You'll sometimes see the name uh, uh, flore let me see, is it fluorescence, well, it's FACS, F-A-C-S, uh, Fluorescence Assisted Cell Sorting, I think it is. What's the A stand for? Activated. Ah, Fluorescence Activated Cell Sorting, thank you. Okay. So what are the principles? We still have to have a light source. So that's going to come usually from uh, a, a specific wavelength. We want to be able to measure a specific uh, fluorescence emission. And we're going to make use of microfluidics pretty heavily. This is the ability to create a, a focused stream of particles at a, at a certain density. Right? We don't want to have cells glomped onto each other as they move through the stream. We want them to be separated from each other. We're going to make use of electrostatic particle separation. We're going to get into that in the next slide. Uh, for our sorting. And if you're going to make sense of the data in the end, you're really going to need multivariate data analysis. Because um, in almost every case, we're measuring more than two different um, fluorescence channels for a sample. So a lot of this dates from a fellow named Coulter, who realized that cells do a pretty poor job of conducting electrical current. So blood is a suspension of cells in plasma, but plasma has an awful lot of ions in it. So the plasma itself is a pretty good conductor, but it's got cells in it which are not. So you can start, you can start estimating, based on the conductance of, conductance of blood, how many cells there are within that, uh, within that blood. If the ratio of cells to plasma increases, the conductance decreases as well. Which means that, in effect, when you, don't, when you are no longer able to pass a a voltage easily through this droplet, it probably contains a cell. So the Coulter principle is this, this fundamental principle on which we decide where the particles are in these streams within a flow cytometer. On the inside, we see that our, have our, our cell sample coming in, and the nozzle is separating them so that we get a nice stream of individual particles at a given time. We have a laser that is shining there, and that laser is allowing us to cause fluorescence in, in, these, um, uh, in these particles. We may then measure different, uh, different frequencies of emitted light using different photomultipliers over here. So this is giving us the ability to measure um, how much fluorescence is, is resulting from this particular uh, excitation that we're providing. And all of that gets captured on our workstation. Good message? That wasn't good message at all? Ooh. That's too bad. All right. So in this case, we're doing measurements at four different colors, four different frequencies, four different wavelengths, however you want to put it. We see that FITC is producing a signal down here. PE is making a signal here, PETR, right in this space. And we've got this really wide uh, pattern of fluorescence from PE psi phi. So we can measure all four of these at the same time. So it may be that a particle is, is a, uh, has all four of these dyes uh, attached to it, and then we see the fluorescence of all of them at once. So we get a high signal from all of those. Or it might be that some combination of those is present. After all, we tend to associate dyes with a particular, um, say, cell surface antigen, something like that. Uh, for, for the process of separation. Now, the, this field has its characters. We've already mentioned Coulter, but I really appreciated uh, learning about Howard Shapiro, who's uh, still an active uh, flow cytometrist and has a, quite a collection of sayings around the network. So I wanted to share a few of these. His first law is that a 51 micron particle clogs a 50 micrometer orifice. This is something that happens whenever we deal with microfluidics. We have a lot of very small pore sizes or channel sizes that we're trying to jam things through. And inevitably, we get clogs. So his, uh, his first law is just about that, that kind of problem. His second law, what you see is what you get. That, that might sound really facile. But in fact, he's arguing that if you haven't set up an experiment so that you're able to observe fluorescence um, usefully, uh, if, if the visual data collected by your flow cytometer uh, is insufficient to answer your biochemical question, you're out of luck. The experiment is only going to give you what, what you've designed it to give you. 
Third law, what's in the bottle isn't necessarily what's on the label. Has anyone experienced that? I know that I have. We, uh, we, we frequently buy bovine serum albumin as kind of a, a single protein test in proteomics. And people don't really consider the fact that when you buy BSA, you get a whole bunch of extra proteins for free. Anyway, what's in the bottle isn't on the label. Okay. Sixth law, I skipped a few. They weren't all really you know, amazing, I thought, but these are fine. Sixth law, there are some cell identification problems that even monoclonal antibodies can't solve. Everyone loves to have a good monoclonal antibody. I mean, if you have a single antibody that recognizes a single epitope, I mean, that's, that's grand. But in fact, not everything we would like to know about cells is available from that. Seventh law, this is the one that I decided to include this, this slide for. No data analysis technique can make good data out of bad data. I would like us all to reflect on this moment. <laughs> No data analysis technique can make good data out of bad data. I will not tell you how many times in my career I've been asked to save somebody's experiment for publication because they didn't get the result they hoped for. Sometimes redoing the experiment, redesigning the experiment is very necessary. So no data analysis is going to save you if your data are in fact deficient. Okay, now compensation was one of those terms I mentioned this morning. It's something I really wanted to make sure everybody understood. So here we are looking at past bands at which we, uh, at which we detect a series of different fluorophores. So FITC is this space right here. PE is over here. PETR is in here. PE psi 5. So I, I described it, said that the shoulder of one die can add intensity to another channel. So imagine that you've got a whole pile of signal from PE, this yellow curve here. As the, as the signal you're receiving from PE grows, the apparent signal that you receive in this bandpass orange of L3 here, the one for PETR, the more of the yellow signal you have, the more of the orange signal you apparently have. But that's just a shoulder. It's, it's, the, it's a, a minority um, uh, wavelength that this fluorescence produces, but if you have enough of this yellow signal, it's going to cause this orange signal to appear greater. We need to be able to subtract off the amount of in, uh, the the amount of overlap essentially. So, if we have a measurement in this FL2 region, if we have samples in which we've explicitly tested how much uh, signal we see when there's um, when FL3 is missing. We're able to know how much we must subtract from here given a certain signal that we have seen here. That's what compensation is all about. Recognizing that these, that these fluorescence spectra overlap and being able to reduce these amounts to reflect the amount that's been contributed by neighboring channels. Okay. And we're going to get to the topic of gating. Gating is another one of these very essential topics for flow cytometry. In this case, we have the, the distinction between real-time and software gating. So in real-time gating, we've told the instrument some of the cells in this mixture are completely uninteresting to us. We don't want anything that lacks, uh, say, a CD4 receptor. So if that's the case, we can use real-time gating to focus the instrument's attention on just the cells we actually want to see. So real-time gating allows us to do that. More typically, the gating that we work with is a, an after-the-fact uh, data analysis challenge, where we want to say what fraction of all of the cells that we measured were positive for this or, or, or for that. You know, so we have, the, we have measurements of these channels. We want to now dissect the cell populations out to say, what fraction of them meets certain criteria. And for that, we think of it as sort of uh, analysis uh, gating or software gating. So in this first case, we, we note that the cells are separating by the fluorescent intensities that they, uh, the, 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 the emissions they produce in a combination of dyes. So if we have a dye versus dye plot, side scatter here versus CD45, we want to specify a subpopulation of cells that we want to include or exclude in further analysis. 
So here we've got the, the granule sites, monocytes, and lymphocytes uh, pulled out. I just used this uh, example drawn from BioRed in this case. But we want to be able to pull out these particular cell populations for subsequent dissection, probably, or for subsequent uh, separation into other categories. So one simple way to think about this is called a quadrant analysis, where we can specify a threshold in a particular die and a threshold in another die. That gives us a, a threshold in each of these, and we can ask how the cells separate among these four. So here we would just say these are the double positives and that it's, it, it has enough threshold in PE and enough, uh, enough uh, signal in FITC to be considered a positive in both of them. So in effect, play, placing two linear rules like this separates the data into four quadrants, thus the name quadrant analysis. But you are not restricted to simple higher than this, lower than that um, thresholding. You can also create shapes in software like Flojo that, uh, that give us the ability to perform Boolean logic. So here we have an ellipse that we've used to reflect, uh, to, to declare this is region one, and then we've got something a little like a trapezoid for region two. But with those two areas defined, we can specify that we want uh, the, the cell population that is not found in R1 and in R2. So you can basically say that the intersection of those zones is off limits, that those cells are not going to be considered. So the Boolean combination gives you a lot more power to be able to, uh, plus, plus the ability to define um, varied shapes by get in gating, gives you a lot more power to pull out a particular cell population. Sometimes this goes through multiple rounds. As I've said, having gated once, you may want to gate again. If you're measuring on five or six channels at the same time, you really have the power to do something like that. So this paper from 2011 was a pretty good example of that. In these, they had CD1B, uh, sorry, CD11B positives and SSCA. So they're using that to pull out the lower half of the myeloid uh, of, of the cells here. And now we see that we have uh, the ability to distinguish uh, in, our, in our, our, our T cells and B cells by using this TCR beta and B220 marker. Uh, we can then pull out the T cells, and within those, separate to CD8 positive and CD4 positive T cells. So this is an example where sequential applications of gating allow us to get to more and more specific cell types. But we're not done. We can also pull these aside, and here they were looking for, uh, let me see, hematopoietic, uh, what were these? Zero and, oh, I'm, I'm losing track. Cell populations are not actually in my game, so I don't know them very well. But in this case, they were able to use serial applications of gatings right, to say that the cells we grabbed here were now going to separate on a different set of axes. This is what I, what I would refer to as kind of a, a it, it is like a multidimensional analysis, but in this case, it's used in serial fashion, which is not the way we would do it with statistics, but that's okay. But, there's been this challenge among immunologists and other groups that make heavy use of flow cytometry to want to measure more and more and more dyes in a single experiment, which means that with each step, compensation gets harder, right? Because the more dyes you jam into the spectrum, the more you have to deal with compensation and overlap among these emissions. So if you're doing a... Uh, that was weird. Someone just tried to come in. I don't know. So, the more colors that you try to bring into these experiments, the further you get from our ability to understand our own data. And people, uh, many of the people throughout Cape Town, for example, make use of manual gating. They'll draw their gates themselves in the Flojo software and use that to determine what their cell how their cell populations divide out. But as the number of dyes increases, our ability to understand what cell populations we've really got kind of goes out the window. Let's just imagine that you, uh, that you uh, treat each dye as producing a high or a low result. If you have six different dyes, how many different, how many different populations have you got? Each dye is high or low. If you've got six dyes, how many combinations of high and low do you have? It is not 12. 
It's the same as the bit question that we were talking about to start. Remember I said if you've got two, if you've got two different, if you've got just a high or a low measurement on each die, and you have six dies, you have two to the sixth different combinations of, uh, of, of cell populations. So our ability to understand all these different colors has gotten pretty weak, really. I mean, once we get out to uh, our five color experiments, we, we now have so many different combinations going that our, our ability to analyze our own data is falling apart. This has reached kind of its, uh, its natural moment of peril with the introduction of Cytoff. So Cytoff is, uh, is, still, is still doing measurements of different cell populations, but here we're using different metal uh, elements to label our samples instead, and we're measuring those metals in time of flight mass spectrometry. So you see this really does fit in right after the mass spec stuff for a reason. Cytoff gives us the ability to differentiate all of these different uh, all the all of these different metal ions by their stable isotope mass. So instead of having a fluorescent intensity associated with a particular dye, you have a mass spec intensity associated with a particular metal. So it's a very different kind of analysis. Now we do not have a lot of crosstalk between these channels. Our ability to tell europium from uh, SM, oh my goodness, I should know this. Anyone know what SM the element is? S SN is tin, isn't it? Selenium? Selenium, that's S E M, I think. Uh, SM, it's all right. I, I, I thought I knew that off the top of my head, I didn't. So we have all of these different labels that we can apply, but now we're not separating on the basis of, um, of microfluidics and measuring by fluorescence. Now we're doing our separations quite differently and measuring through mass spectrometry. Samarium. Samarium. My goodness. It's been a long time since I even read that name. Oof. Back when I was in high school, I, I was part of a kind of a, a group of friends that really enjoyed games, and we make a lot of games out of our education. So we would try to memorize things like digits of pi and memorize the, uh, the, uh, the periodic table. I, I saw the eye roll, that's okay. I still know a lot of digits of pi. <laughs> I won't even tell you about the two or three weeks we spent trying to write software that would, uh, that would compute um, quadratic formulas for us. So uh, you know if you have a, a, a formula in the form ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero, you need to be able to solve for what values of, of x are feasible. So we, we tried writing software for a long time that would start with these values of A, B, and C and come back to you with X. We kept running into stuff like, how do you minimize a, uh, the part under a radical, you know? We spent a lot of time doing stuff like this, so I, we were nerds, but we kind of embraced it. It was all right. Now we play chess by email. I'm not sure that's better. All right. Hey, I, I, I have won all but one game against this fellow, so... Oh, no, I'm sorry. I did one, one who stalemated me, that's true. I was, I was being lazy that day. But my chest is pretty awful, so I won't say much more about it. It's fine. So, some of the things that you could pull out of this are things like kinetic analyses. So we have unstimulated and stimulated cells here. We're looking at different fluorescence... Um, uh, fluorescence use, uh, is, is measuring quantity in this case. And we can see a shift um, in response to... Uh, as, a, as a function of time, seeing this fluorescence shift out to the, the deep part of the field. So being able to produce measurements like this is very powerful. If this is happening in just a particular cell population, to be able to pull those out and get uh, quantitative measurements. All right. Along the way, uh, this morning we took a quick look at a, a FCS file. FCS. So FCS is an example of a file format that has emerged for the whole community of people using flow cytometry to regularly record the data from their experiments. It was introduced all the way back in 1984. People have been thinking about how to represent data for a long, long time. And you see that it's gone through quite a few updates uh, into the, the, current, uh, the current decade. The, the 3.1 update is what was described in this 2010 uh, paper. So people who are invested in being able to use the data from any flow cytometer in an open and exchangeable way have settled on this FCS. In this case, the whole field 
a standardized derivative. So no matter who makes your, your flow cytometer, you can kick out an FCS file. And that means anyone can benefit from software that reads FCS files to do, statist uh, to do statistics. So we, we saw an example of that this morning with FlowCore and FlowViz, which could work from these FCS files. More recently, people have been working on adapting uh, these FCS files to be able to store data from CyTOF. Um, they are obviously a lot denser in information since we have all of these different channels that we can measure. So there are a lot of concepts to pull out today. Um, in thinking about imaging, I want you to remember that being able to contrast, being able to see empirically that the, that the distribution of intensity values is giving you as much contrast as possible uh, to, to reveal the details of your image matters. The resolution mostly refers to uh, how, how, how close two features may be together and still be distinguished. We think about that in terms of megapixels these days, but the, the real definition is really about how close two objects can be together and still be distinguished. Segmentation, we did an example of that this morning. I would expect that at this, at this point you know that being able to separate objects from their background and from their surroundings is what we're talking about on that score. Registration, being able to recognize the same object in slightly different scenes. Being able to deal with uh, key flow cytometry concepts is also going to matter. So I, I would expect everyone knows what compensation is by this time. People should have some knowledge of why we use gating. And, of course, having some knowledge of what an FCS file is is a good thing as well. So I have uh, taken us to 3.13, not even 90 minutes today, but it's a relatively short lecture. But I hope that it's been one that has filled your mind with all kinds of great concepts that you can apply in understanding at least the research talks within this division. Tomorrow morning at 9.30, we will take the final quiz. Who will take home the tchotchkes that I have found as first and second prize? We don't know. What happens if two people tie? Well, I actually have two things that we can treat as first prizes. So, study hard, do brilliantly on tomorrow morning's quiz. I'll see you all at 9.30. Thanks. Has the uh, video stopped? Yeah.